Why these finalists? I love that the public voted for this one. It's what we're all asking. And we could have had every expert up here telling me it was no good and I would still want to marry. And not everyone is on the same page. There are body parts and there's curly hair and a strange pairing. A bit of an odd pairing, but we paired these up. And we're not talking about them. Tonight, critics let loose on the best and worst of Art Prize 8's finalists. Good evening and welcome to Critical Discourse, the home of Charge Conversation at Art Prize, powered by ITC. My name is Todd Herring, and tonight we've wrangled three art experts into helping us explore what it is about 20 works of art that managed to become finalists in Art Prize, the world's largest art competition. Was it craftsmanship, subject matter, location, or just pure luck that garnered the attention of the voting public or an expert juror? Tonight we are asking why. Why these finalists or... WTF for short, and we ask to you at home as well to help us, to send us your thoughts using the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF. You can use that anywhere hashtags are accepted. You can also follow along on Twitter or you can add your comment to the Art Prize Facebook page. Tonight we'll be talking about the two-dimensional and installation categories. Tomorrow is three-dimensional and time-based. Joining me tonight, my co-host and moderator is Art Prize Director of Exhibitions and Snapchat aficionado, oh, and resident translator for Art World Jargon. Please welcome Mr. Kevin Beist. And now let's introduce, introduce tonight's critics. Three soon-to-be infamous art experts chomping at the bit to ruthlessly pick <laughs> apart each and every one of the finalist works. Tonight, joining us, we have Chad Allegood, curator at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas, the already infamous Jerry Saltz, no stranger to art prize, <laughs> senior art critic for New York Magazine, and Kristen Fleischman, director of public projects at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis, Missouri. Let's hear it for our three panelists. All right, let's take a quick look at how we got to where we are today. Let's go back almost two weeks to opening day when Art Prize 8 kicked off with 1,453 works of art eligible for the half million dollars in prizes. Five days later, the art experts serving as this year's category jurors narrowed the field down to the 20 juried award finalists eligible for one of four $12,500 category awards and, of course, the $200,000 juried grand prize. Alongside the know-it-all art experts, you, the voting public, cast hundreds of thousands of votes to determine the 20 artist entries deemed worthy of the equivalent public vote category awards and the $200,000 public vote grand prize. And just yesterday, we revealed the Art Prize 8 public vote final 20, and now we have fi 20 finalists chosen by expert jury, 20 chosen by public vote. You can find the full list of all of the finalists at artprize.org slash leaderboard. But tonight, we're focusing our attention on the two-dimensional and installation categories. Once again, please join us, share your thoughts, and use the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF. It's really fun. Just try it, I promise. Okay, to keep things moving along, I'm going to be keeping time, and when you hear this bell, when you hear that bell, it's time to wrap it up so we can move on to the next finalist. It's a powerful bell. Do not taunt the bell. I'm looking at you, Jerry. Okay, don't taunt the ball. All right. Up first. Up first is the two-dimensional category. The two-dimensional public vote award is presented by Foremost Insurance, and the juror who selected the jury award for finalists in the two-dimensional category is Tina Rivers Ryan from the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. First up, two-dimensional jury award finalist titled Coherency by Faig Ahmed, showing at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. Coherency is a handmade carpet. Kevin, aside from the fact that it looks like it's melting, can you help, you help us understand why it's a finalist. Yeah, so this is a really fascinating work. This is an artist from Azerbaijan. Uh, not a lot of artists come from there and end up in our prize. And it's in a, a, an interesting location. It's the Gerald Ford Presidential Museum. So tell me, guys, what did you think of this work and sort of the energy and atmosphere of that room in the museum? Let's start with you, Jerry. Well, I was kind of knocked out by this piece. I love the idea that somebody would take one of the oldest arts that we have, weaving. Yeah. or, you know, making clothes, sewing things together, and keeping the tradition absolutely solid of patterns that were arrived at over millennia 
and all of a sudden changing it. I also really like that in the art world they used to job this out uh, to thousands of other people and I love the fact that this would come from one of the countries that is known for producing this. I l really thought this thing has a lot of potential. I could imagine huge ballrooms covered in this mm -hmm. and it would remind you of where they came from. Anybody else? Chad? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jerry. I, I love the conversation between the, the wall and the floor. You know, you, you traditionally see a rug on the floor, but here it is on the wall. And, I mean, he's calling in to question this whole uh, tradition of painting, right? So the citation here would be Jackson Pollock, who famously worked on the floor with paint and then put it on the right. wall. Yeah. And uh, this artist is turning that on its head. All right, moving along. Uh, you guys are going way too easy on this one. Come on, we got to spice it up. Next is two-dimensional <laughs> public vote finalist, Portraits of Light and Shadow by Yao Paolo Goncalves, showing at DeVos Place Convention Center. Yao Paolo describes the work as pixel portrait, created with deliberately angled wood pieces placed in relationship to a specific light source. It's a trick of the eye and cut wood, but why is it a finalist? So people love this one. We, we went there today. The crowds were like just, you know, glomming onto it, looking at it through their phone. Um, the thing I want to start with, Kristen, what do you think about the use of these very well-known images as the subject matter? He's got Girl with the Pearl Earring, Mona Lisa, MLK. Well, they're recognizable people that everyone knows. So, you know, some of this, it's very interactive, so people can switch the light on and off. But also, this use of the phone is technology and pixelation, too. So mm -hmm. having the figures be recognizable to most people that would be coming seems to be an important feature. So you can get past that quickly mm -hmm. and then think about the technology. I found that just uh, it never escapes its craft. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry it took a bit. First question is usually the last question. How long did you ta that take? Yeah. How did you do this? Well, yeah. that's a great question. But if it's just craft, if it doesn't, I think it should have been some image of the, of the whole, like a globe, yeah. or the forest, or underground water supply, or something from the 24th century. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I thought this only was cool craft. Sorry. <laughs> Mm. If the artist is in the room, I couldn't have made it either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, happening in Cutwood, what could be done in Photoshop, perhaps. All right, moving along, let's take a look at Jury Award finalist Transformation uh, by Tequila Hoskins, showing at Homewood Suites. Transformation is a paint, uh, oil paint diptych, meaning that it is presented on two canvases. Kevin. So this is a, uh, yeah, interesting painting. Um, the artist is kind of resurrecting some really classical rendering techniques and inserting some subject matter, particularly an African-American girl, who probably would have been excluded from that type of image making uh, in, in the past. And that was the point that the juror made when she included it on the list. Do you guys buy that argument? Do you think that it's working in that way? Uh, not at all, no. I think, uh, I think the painting is a bit schlocky, honestly. Um, and to see it in mere, why did, why did there need to be two of them? I mean, one was enough, but yeah. two? Um, I think that there were probably some other images that we saw in other installations throughout the day that actually would have made the point that Tino was trying to make a little bit better. Yeah, there was an artist at the, the Grand Rapids Art Museum mm -hmm. that was by Makita Huja that was, did a phenomenal job at yeah. inserting a black body into art history and appropriating that. Look, it is not enough. I met an artist in New York said, that cloud, I took a picture of that cloud over Ferguson. Yeah. Uh, Missouri, and I went, no, you didn't. <laughs> That's just a cloud. You have to be able, artists, to embed thought in material. And the thought of having a black body inscribed into Western art history is not embedded in this work. And so it's just not enough. I'm sorry. Chad, wow. That was harsh. I'd expect that from Jerry, but wow. Okay. Just, <laughs> what, he gets a free pass? Yeah, yeah. That's what I asked for. I know. You were doing exactly what I asked for, and you I came out nice. and you did it. I, 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 I applaud you. I applaud you. Okay. All right. Next up is the two-dimensional public vote finalist, Continental U.S. by Valerie Holstein, showing at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. It is a 15-foot by 9-foot cut glass collage of the lower 48 states. Why? Yeah. So, I, I couldn't tell you, but... Um, all right, so the, 
This is in the same room as the Fagum. It's ca yes. uh, carpet, it's packed, it's chaotic. Everybody was in there finding their states. Uh, Missouri, Arkansas, New York. What did you guys see? Did you find something for yourselves in, in, this, in this piece? Well, besides being sweated on by the hordes of people, um, <laughs> I, I, thought it had a, I thought it had a certain charm to it. There's, there, there was craft there. I mean, it was engaging. People were uh, totally on top of it. I don't know. I mean, I, I was into it. I dug it. I got into it because I like maps. And I think we all do. If I were this person's teacher, I might have taken a sledgehammer to it and said, now make another map and really um, make each state kind of a little bit more creative. Don't just do wind for the Windy City, corn for Nebraska. Mm. Let's have some insight and keep it simple, stupid. K-I-S-S. -S. Mm. Kiss. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, very similar thoughts. I think this piece was most interesting as a conversation piece with the people that we were in the room with, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, yeah, we all talked about where we where were from. from. Yeah. And then we started the Trump versus Hillary thing. It went insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got called a baby killer. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, and with that, Jerry Salt says a unique way of saying... <laughs> I'd like to smash your artwork with a sledgehammer, and you make it feel good when but you do I it. Did. I don't know how you did that. Hold on, if there's any place that, that you can have that debate, we're in a presidential museum, right? right? Like that's, that's right. That's the place, and we're at this Democratic art event. Like and we're, I've been we're there four out. times. I really love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really do, genuinely. But in that the room, place. people were crowding around the map. All right, yeah. while all right. The I rang the bell. the bell, you guys. I rang the bell. We're moving on. Our next two-dimensional finalist is a juror's pick called Survival Does Not Lie in the Heavens, showing at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. The work is a digital inkjet photographic print mounted on Sintra, which is plastic, a collection of stage lights taken from the album covers of live performances of now-deceased gospel, blues, and jazz musicians. It's stars, but it's not stars, but it is. Kevin, what is it? Uh, so, so this one is, it's really cool. It's a beautiful image. Um, changes a lot when you read that artist statement to find out that this is sort of a constructed Photoshop <coughs> thing and not uh, a star field. Um, did that work for you, Kristen? Do you, are, you, are you a fan of the like artist label reveals uh, something hidden? No? I mean, I like to learn about the concept, yes, but I think this piece needs the label to learn more about what it is. I think that this artist's work, he has work that's stronger than this, like, by far. Um, so I think it's beautiful to look at, but kind of like, to me, okay, okay, mm -hmm. you know? I think there's a reason why it was a juror's pick and not a popular pick. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it said nothing to me, because yeah. I didn't read the label, no. um, and I just walked right past it in the gallery to better stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the juror in this one, they, she, she talked about sort of this, the, the kind of poetry of like radio waves from this music is like traveling into the stars. Did you, are you buying any of that? Yeah, no? You can't just put it in the label, mm. you, which is what they're saying rightfully. Yeah. And you guys were going to change this in the art world. For about 15 years, all the art's been in the label. And then you have to read these damn things. You can't figure out what they're talking about. And these two people are right. It <laughs> has to be in the work or it's not in there. Mm. Well, I think we have uh, some consensus on that one. All right, well, there you have it. <laughs> now it's time for a short break. When we return, we'll be discussing the rest of the two-dimensional category on why these finalists don't go away. At ITC, we're thrilled to support arts and culture initiatives across the state of Michigan, including Art Prize right here in Grand Rapids. As the sponsor of Critical Discourse, ITC helps power the thousands of conversations that are sparked within this studio and beyond its walls, bringing arts and culture in our city to a national stage. Over the last two weeks, we've seen tens of thousands of visitors exploring Art Prize, filling hotels, restaurants, and local businesses, driving the economic and cultural impact of Art Prize across West Michigan. Tonight on the Critical Discourse stage, we're examining the public vote and juried award shortlists in Why These Finalists? Whether what you hear tonight surprises, excites, infuriates, or confounds you, we hope that you're as excited as we are to hear what the panelists have to say. Absolutely. We hope you enjoy the rest of tonight's show. Welcome back to Critical Discourse, where we're asking three art experts who we've kidnapped, brought to Grand Rapids, and put them on live television so we can ask them 
Why? Why did the jurors and why did the voting public select these finalists? Let's keep the conversation going in the two-dimensional category. With the public vote finalist known as Sand Sturgeon by Gary Moran showing at the Gerald R. <laughs> Ford Presidential Mu Museum. Sand Sturgeon is a 16-foot sturgeon made out of sand. Simple enough. <laughs> Kevin, what do you think? So, sand painting's been around for a long time, but usually we're used to seeing a mandala image. Uh, you know, it's, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow, it's transient. But why the fish? What did you guys think? Chad, start with you. Uh, I think, yeah, it is here today, and could it be gone tomorrow? It I mean, a, a, a giant, a giant uh -huh. fish made out of sand? I mean I, I mean, I get why people like it. It's colorful, it's fun. Yeah. Um, but really? I mean, you guys, you're not, you're not feeling it. Jerry, Kristen? I think this person should have channeled their inner Jules Verne and tap the imagination, not just this cool skill, and everyone loves a sturgeon, but again. <laughs> really? I, I okay, said we okay. should We're get the broom. Along. Move along here. I, Wait. I, I will argue with oh you and say that everybody God. loves a herring, but that's personal. Uh, All right. Boo, boo. <laughs> boo. That's my own joke. Okie dokie. Uh, with that, we'll move along to the seventh of our, uh, seventh of our ten two-dimensional finalist, uh, Le Bet by Isaac Aoki. A series of eight photographs of nude models outside in the dead of winter wearing masks. It's kind of an eyes wide shut sort of thing going on here. What do you think, Kevin? So, uh, I read the artist statement in this one, and he talked about wanting to do a nude series of, of uh, photos, but wanted them to be sort of less, less exploitative, and he thought that the mask helped that. Kristen, do you think... I think it's the exact opposite. Uh, I think they couldn't be why? more exploitative yeah. of uh, certain types of bodies and nature. Like, I feel bad for nature in this one. Like, I really do. <laughs> See, if you're keeping score, the jury picks are doing, like, way worse than the public picks. I don't know mm -hmm. if you guys have noticed yep. that yet. Any other thoughts on this one? I... You know, I mean, no. I mean, there's nothing else right. to say. Yeah. With that, there's not much to say. We're all going to gonna apologize to nature for, uh, <laughs> yeah. for that one. That was uh, taken in the Sagaduck, I think the was Sagaduck Dunes area, so uh, that you know exactly where they were. All right, number eight of 2D finalists is another selected by the voting public. Ashes to Ashes by Jacqueline Gilmore showing at the Bob. It is a 17 foot wide by nine foot tall painting, oil painting of a forest fire. Kevin, how can we sleep while the trees are burning? Yes, good question. Um, yeah, not even a laugh out of that one? <laughs> I, was, I worked on that. A, okay, oh. Jerry, you've seen a lot of painting in your day. How, okay. how is this? Is it working? What's Look going it. on? I got to back up just one little bit. In the 19th century, it was very common for artists to, like, like uh, Frederick Church, to do these big landscapes and put them behind curtains and have special gas lights on them for mm -hmm. special lighting effects. That was pretty cool. Yeah. All of that was at work here. All of that control was exerted, but I really think that the painting itself is pretty uh, unoriginal and kind of gimmicky. I'm really sorry if the artist is here. Anybody else? Yeah, it felt like a stage set. And as you mentioned, yeah, there's a history of that there, but man, oh man, it was hot right there in that corner, and it was like a stage for the performance of your own guilt. Right? So right. this forest is burning because of you, you miserable non-recycler. Um, right. And so I just... And like the response was for people to take selfies in front of it, which if it's about deforestation in the rainforest, why is it fun to take selfies in front of that subject matter? Yeah. So content, application, it didn't come together. Yeah. All right, there we go. Some harsh critique, but I think uh, productive. All right. Uh, <laughs> I did not go to art school, so I haven't experienced that. Uh, the next two-dimensional juried award finalist is an eight-foot by five-foot watercolor titled Charted Memories. Sorry, is that right? Chart yeah, Charted Memories by Karen Cruel showing at the Calvin College 106 Gallery. Kevin. Abstract painting. Jerry, you, you uh, helped popularize this term, zombie abstraction. Is this a, a, an example of that, or is something more happening here? Zombie abstraction is when you have uh, an artist moving into the sort of dead or undead body of boring abstraction. This is attempting to kind of change and to make it like a crystal thing. I would say there's an enormous amount of great work in Art Prize this year, work that I 
could be world class and brought into prime time immediately. And I think that this is not an example of that. And it breaks my heart to say that because there's so much great work in the competition Agreed. this year. Yeah. I think, you know, this, this competition is radically open, right? And the expectations are when you come to the table and you come to our prize, you're going to bring it, mm -hmm. right? And when you stand in front of that object, you don't get that feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, Art Prize has higher expectations, bar none. Yeah, there were works in that gallery that were far more stunning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've raised the bar. That's right. Now some of us, we jurors, have to come up to your level is what I think has to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I hate this. Well, all right. Hopefully uh, we will have uh, more finalists that will have brought in it for you guys. Um, maybe, maybe this next one. This next one, it's our last finalist in the two-dimensional category. It is a public vote finalist. It's a giant 16-foot wide by 7-foot tall watercolor pencil and acrylic creation on watercolor canvas. Titled Protect and Serve by Andrew J. Woodstock showing at the Bob. Kevin. So, uh, this is not the first giant depiction of an old photo of men in uniform that we've seen it in our prize, before. if you know your art prize history. Um, so it feels a little familiar. Uh, depicting the police is, is, I think, a political act no matter what, in one way or another. Um, what did you guys think? Did it work? How would this play in St. Louis? I actually felt kind of sick seeing this painting uh, wow. coming from St. Louis. Who got um, sick over I it. literally was Incredible. feeling ill because I think that uh, the title of this work was Protect and Serve. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that a bunch of white men on motorcycles aggressively looking at you should be the embodiment of what our police should stand for. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. I had less problems with um, that particular content and more about the execution, yeah. right? It very clearly was projected onto the canvas, then penciled in, and then if you get close, and I encourage everybody to go and get close to that painting, there's a bunch of little hash marks without a kind of uh, follow-up technique. So, um, sure, bad content, but I think, at the end of the day, bad mm -hmm. painting. I did like that there were post-its next to it, and people could, so I was, Black Lives Matter. There you go. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Interesting. Did anything else get physically ill when they saw the, the <laughs> painting at all? I agree with my two panelists. Yeah. Images that strike uh, strong emotions, no matter how you feel about that. I, I like motorcycles. Is it possible? I, we're trying to figure out why these finalists. Why did it get in there? Is it a motorcycle play? The realism. What is it? Yeah. Realism yeah. has a secret word it uses on people, which translates in a funny way to, oh, it must have skill. They must have taken time. But what I would always say to you is, is it conventional skill? Mm -hmm. Are they inventing a new definition, redefining skill? And this work is conventional photorealism. Come with us, folks, and don't just fall for the skill. Otherwise, we'll get medieval on your butt. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, there you have it. Now you know why. Now don't fall for it, though, all right? Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we return, we'll be discussing the 10 finalists in the installation category. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's dive right into the installation category, not to be confused with the three-dimensional category. Installation entries are dependent on the site in which they are installed. The location is not a neutral ground, but makes up an important ingredient of the work. We'll be discussing five finalists selected by public vote, alongside five finalists selected by one art expert, Dina Hagag, the director of the Contemporary in Baltimore, Maryland. But before we discuss one of Dina's picks, let's take a look at the installation public vote finalist titled Sweet Spot. Spot by Kazi Danielle Studio showing at Brush Studio. It's an installation of multicolor nylon cords hanging ceiling to floor. There are 19 miles of nylon cord filling the space. Sounds pretty groovy. Kevin. All right, so lot, big crowd pleaser here. Lots of optical effects happening as you're moving through the space. It never looks quite the same twice. Um, Chad, what did you think when you walked through there? Uh, I, I thought it was pretty crowd-pleasing, right? It's, it's nice to see color. It's good to feel like installation is changing with you. There are a number of other artists that are working out there in this space. Of course, historically, Fred Sandback, and now uh, Gabriel Daw, Megan Geckler, a couple of other people out there. I, my biggest problem with this installation was uh, the uh, display mechanism, which, uh, which felt sort of clunky. You wanted it to feel ethereal, and it just didn't, right? Kristen? Yeah, the 
same comments. I think that that was overly designed. The boxes. The boxes were overly yeah. designed, and I think, um, to your point, that installation work should be site specific or site resonant, and this piece could be anywhere or adapted for any place. Mm -hmm. I think they're right. It did. It, it's great to have art that slows you down. And that you look at it and you think, oh, well, it's just a bunch of uh, threads. And then when you look at it, you do get quiet and your focus goes in and out. Mm -hmm. And that was really good. And I do just think it was held back by its over-design. It, it should be not such a big mechanism. Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm. Stop calling me stupid, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, um, perhaps a little bit over-engineered, but still kind of magical, I think, in the, the color harmonies that I saw. I thought it was fascinating. Thank oh, you, Todd. It okay. flew me to a different location altogether. So take that for simple. All right, we have uh, up next an Installation Public Vote Award finalist, aptly titled 250 prepared AC motors, 325 kilograms of Ruth lathe, and one kilometer of rope by Zimun, showing at Site Lab. Rumsey Street project. So more vertical lines filling a space. Maybe that's a trend. Uh, also the sound. Talk to me about the sound of this piece. What did you guys think as you, as you walked into this old church? It felt almost um, tribal in the way that you interacted with the work. It felt like um, it was resonating with your own body. It right. encouraged you to walk around it. To, and, and you felt overwhelmed a bit. And that's part of the, uh, the impulse, I think. And they also looked like humans, weirdly. They had their own individual ways of moving in the space. I love those individual units. I was, I was blown away. Yeah, I love this piece as well. I think it, it points to the mechanism that works with the piece. And it's also a pointing to material. It's not trying to be something that it shouldn't. It's wood. Mm -hmm. It's simple. And I think it was really moving and powerful work. I also like, frankly, that they took a formal approach to a former church. Usually you give an artist like a, a charge space, like a firehouse, a church, they'll overdo the subject matter. Yeah. This person, in a sense, uh, did it very subtle, very formal, and boy, was it loud. It's like the way you kids love noisy restaurants. I, d I don't understand that. <laughs> All right, Uncle Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Bill O'Reilly here. <laughs> now, I, a question, though. The last one that you, you said was over-engineered, uh, vertical lines in a space like this. This one is mechanical. The vertical lines are going all over the place. Uh, and yet you called it simpler. How does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question, Todd. And I think it... Uh, so you described the title. You had to take, you know, 20 seconds to describe the title. It emphasizes its own making in a way that the um, vertical uh, string didn't. It, it emphasizes the structure. It says, here I am, I'm just wood, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. And so there's a simplicity there that I think is pretty elegant. Mm. There were just wires dro pulling up the wood, dropping it. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was not over-determined, over-designed. No. Mm. It was something I could make at home. It's like imagining you're the drummer. Mm -hmm. I could do that. So, the, uh, the wood installation hitting the sweet spot, per se. That's the title of the color one. Yeah, yeah. It, also, what it, does, it fit oh, the fine. space nope, nicely. No, we're done. We're done. Yeah. Sorry, we're going, we're going on. We'll give you more time. As long as you get the last joke. The, yeah, yeah, no, the guy in my ear, so we have yeah. to move on. Show. I'm sorry. I, know. I apologize. All right, next. <laughs> next, we have another installation, Jury Award finalist, titled uh, This Space is Not Abandoned by the Cultura Collective, showing at 912 Granville. The entry takes over a warehouse in the heart of the vibrant Roosevelt Park neighborhood that includes expansive murals, paintings, photographs, multimedia installation, fashion, dance, and theater. Theater. Community members were invited to, the, to own the space and create freely and hold up one another's cultures, identities, and visions. A lot going on there. Kevin. Yeah, so this is a pretty unique entry. Um, it's really sort of like a, an art prize entry as community center, community meeting place, gathering place. Um, Jerry, you and uh, Kristen and I, we went there yesterday. Tell us what was going on in the space. Well, it was almost like seeing once upon a time the Iliad would be performed in public in your neighborhood. And the idea was to keep your public interested, 
by making it really a great story. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was seeing the makings of that in Grand Rapids instead yeah. of formalized theater. And I just, I was sort of blown away yeah. that so, you guys created that space. I've been a couple times, and when we went yesterday, there was a play happening. Yeah. But when I visited before, that wasn't a part of it. So it's yeah. sort of like every time you visit, there's this different element. Yeah, it felt like it had life. That it, the work came from the community, it's supported by the community, and I thought it was a really beautiful project that they all applied together mm -hmm. and owned it, and it's changing over time, and so you have to be there and be yeah. present and interact with it in a way that's really fantastic. Yeah. So they, they talked about, because um, it's a collective of 17 artists, and wow. a curator kind of pulled this together, yeah. and they talked about um, even you know, doing that collectively rather than having each of those works as its own separate voting number as being kind of like a, a, a critique of our prize in a way because mm -hmm. it's a non-competitive space. So tell me about that, like seeing this among everything else that's like in this competition. Does that work? Yeah, yeah. I think it's wonderful. It was a breath of fresh air. Yeah. I mean, you know, compared to the other sites we went to, it's cohesive, it tells a story, and it's an important story. I cut you off last time, so it's I was going to let you finish that Thank one. you. And you said a breath of fresh air, which, which we all like a breath of fresh <laughs> air. All right, our next public vote final, uh, installation finalist is Rock Around by Aaron Zenz, showing at the Grand Rapids Children's Museum. Rock Around is a collection of 1,000 painted rocks. 500 of the rocks were arranged outside the Grand Rapids Children's Museum, and the other 500 rocks were placed all over Grand Rapids in random <laughs> locations. Kevin, is it rocking or not? <laughs> so this is, yeah, so this is the idea of a, an art prize entry conceived of as a game, right? It's a scavenger hunt all over the city. I don't know, did you guys find any rocks, or what did you think about this conceit? The, the one rock that I found was in the van that we went around in today, but, um, yes. and, and I'm not going to be the critic who dumps on one guy playing with his six kids and coming up with a really creative <laughs> way to... Uh, so, um, great job, do more of that, love the family, art making, cheers. I love looking for stones, I've spent my whole life staring at the ground. That's cool, that's a really early Neolithic place in all of us. Uh, we saw another family's work where they rebuilt the entire Nassau space program yeah, yeah. in their backyard. That's, that's yeah. Hillary and Max. That's yeah, you? Yeah. No, oh. I wrote that. You uh, did? Yeah, right on. Yeah. Now that yeah. family seemed to be branching out into life where this one was going into its family. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I love families making work together, but this seems kind of like a Pinterest project mm. that a family put together. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm a mother. I have a family, mm -hmm. and I make work with my child, so mm -hmm. I agree the, the Hildebrand and Maximum... That's yeah. successful. And we will talk right. about that one tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow night. Yeah. Tomorrow night. I'm yeah. that Sorry. off. Sorry. We're Sorry. not going into that. Because that's time-based. The time-based category will be live uh, right here at Wood TV <laughs> at 7 o'clock tomorrow. So we can talk about it then. Uh, that's higher ground. Go look at it first so that you're up to date before we go live. All right. Our next ju installation yeah. Jury Award finalist is Hybrid Structures by Kronschlager, Amenta, and Loft, showing at Site Lab, the Rumsey Street Project. This architectural intervention of wood and steel access ramps is a response to the abandoned buildings that launched the north side of Rumsey Street. Kevin, tell us about this massive installation. So there's a lot going on here. This is, um, you know, this is, uh, if the last one was uh, entry as game, this one is entry as infrastructure, right? It's, it's as much architecture as it is sculpture. Um, and it's, it's very much sort of the connective tissue between different things happening within Site Lab. So it's even a little hard to pull apart from the whole phenomenon of what's going on out there. Jerry, what were, what were your thoughts? I think that Site Lab is a world-class um, installation group or whatever they call themselves. You could bring this to Documenta in Germany and it would be respected. I loved the fact of walking through buildings that they took apart or that they left standing. I became like a bird perched on these walkways. I'm a weird person that loves to look at traffic as it's going by, so I found a spot to look at the uh, 113 and I felt good. I love that it became a sort of stage on which the community performed, right? Yeah. That, that on that surface, which is wheelchair accessible, mm -hmm. working with this art, being able to give, uh, it served as the runway for uh, yeah. a, dis a disability fashion show, yeah, right? Have, yep. Incredible. And, yeah. and to be able to um, work with the texture of a space and to serve the needs of the audience, I mean, 
that's social practice right there yeah. and mm-hmm. really, really beautifully done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very Kristen. well done. I love that it's really about getting a new perspective on a neighborhood as mm-hmm. well. And we often don't take the time to step outside of that and it physically helps you yeah. do that, which is so important. Yeah, so for, for somebody who's like, who might say, this is infrastructure and it might be beautiful and well-made, but I don't see it as art. How do you, can you bridge that gap for us quickly? Like, how do you, how does this function as art? I mean, it's intention, yeah. right? The intention is an experience, and it becomes a platform for the community and for people and for artists. We saw a fabulous performance yesterday. Was it Nuns on a Ramp? Mm-hmm. Gorgeous. Nuns on a Ramp. It mm-hmm. speaks to the place. It speaks to the neighborhood. It's yeah. And it's kind of subtle in its own way. I just pushed somebody around a museum last week in New York in a wheelchair, and mm-hmm. the person told me, do you know that I can't see any of the pictures here? Mm. They're hung too high. Yeah. I can't see them from this perspective. And in this piece, the artist, for some reason, just knew to hang the work at wheelchair height, and you just get it. Yeah. And all these useless things you think are going on are functioning, yeah. just like art. Yeah. And that's pretty that bell-like. Beautiful. Well said, well said, Jerry. <laughs> but even poignant comments must fall to the bell. So, all right, installation (laughs) category is where it all heats up, and it's going to keep on humming, I promise you that. Stay with us as Critical Discourse continues right after this. Welcome back to the Critical Discourse studio. Now, I know what you're thinking, that our uh, our set looks pretty (laughs) swag. That was a slip, yeah, sorry. No, the set, the set looks pretty... Oh, man, I ruined that one. (laughs) Ruined it. Our set looks great, though, and that's thanks to Hayworth, the official broadcast design partner of Art Prize. All right, moving along. Got to keep it serious. Let's hold this together. All right. Uh, uh, Just a few more finalists to go. Our sixth installation finalist is a juror's pick entitled Christmas Eve 1933 by Mark Dion, also showing at Sight Lab's Rumsey Street Project. The installation is within the rectory of the former Catholic Church, the same rectory that is intervened by hybrid structures, our previously discussed finalist. The installation is a carefully refurbished room recreating the scene of a cluttered parlor of a parish priest about to return home after the last service of the evening. Kevin. So this is a a really kind of pristine, historically accurate installation in the midst of the rest of Sight Lab, which really feels kind of like uh, 20th century ruins, Um, and also a pretty well-known artist. What did you guys think of this? Chad? I think, so... First of all, I'm a big fan of Mark Dion. You know, big artist, it's great to have him here in Grand Rapids. Uh, that said, happening upon this work in the context of that site, it didn't work for me. It felt like a period room, mm-hmm. and, um, and it felt discontinuous in a way that didn't really speak to the site. It worked for me, it sucked me in. I felt it was like an Eleanor Rigby moment of, you know, Father McKinsey writing the words of the sermon that no one will hear. I wondered what page the Bible was open to. What's going on in Michigan in 1933? Is there even an intimation of war or what's going on? And I was pulled into that because this was a real room and as real as it could get, I'm interested in real life right now. All right, with that, uh, our next installation. No, but, uh, what? Oh. If We're I was to tie break, I would say that it was a nice moment of, you know, a, a point that you could say, okay, focus, detailed. I liked it. The, the person tie break. here said, let Kristen talk. So I'm going to ask you a quick follow up question. <laughs> 1933, protect and serve the motorcycles, all right? Yeah. The difference, I know. it harkened you back to a different time. What was the difference between the emotions that those two pieces gave you? Well, nostalgia, right? And it's two different perspectives on that. I think what was nice about the Dion Room is that um, you're drawn in, you're, it's not an aggressive affront of these people lined up on motorcycles. You're drawn in and you start to ask questions. Artwork that makes you ask questions, I always am more drawn to. It's more powerful. Well said. All right, our next installation finalist was selected by public vote, and it's titled The Butterfly Effect by Pettit Smith, showing at the DeVos Place Convention Center. The Butterfly Effect is an installation of 1,234 intricately handmade bronze monarch butterflies, kind of like Frederick Meyer Gardens, but in DeVos Place. Kevin. And bronze. Um, Jerry, you, you wandered through this space, you told me yesterday, uh, right after it was announced as a finalist, and it was kind of a madhouse in there. How, how were people reacting to this piece? 
They loved it. But I really wanted to say, well, first of all, butterflies have the most unusual genitalia in the animal kingdom. <laughs> and Nabokov made an entire study and could identify every butterfly that way. I think that this is only a beginning and that, that this person needs to uh, channel their inner Darwin. Anybody else? What about this? What about the install? What about the install method? It's like it's kind of on these sheets of plexi. Yeah, I, I, I think the install was a little clunky, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go to bat for this work. I thought um, as far as public art goes, and that's how this feels. It's public art. I mean, you they could have outsourced this the actual work to somebody else. These were handmade bronze objects. They were mm -hmm. gorgeous, mm -hmm. and uh, it activated uh, a kind of wonder in the people that were around, and they looked again at the world around them. Hey, can you ask for more? Mm -hmm. All right, that's a thumbs up for the butterflies. Up next, Untitled by Louise Chen is a sprawling, large-scale floral mural painted on the back of the Grand Rapids Ballet Company. The work is part of the UICA Exit Space Project and is an installation juried award finalist. Kevin. Okay, Kristen, let's start with you. Um, sometimes murals can kind of become white noise of a city and we stop noticing them. This one's new, so it catches my eye for the time being. Um, do you think it's, it, it has like a sustained pop? I enjoyed this piece. I think it makes sense for its location. You know, I looked around and thought, where would I be seeing this if I was living in the city? And I think the perspective is really from your vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I think driving by it provides a very pleasant atmosphere to the city landscape. So I enjoyed it. And I also love to see female graffiti artists. I'm a fan of that. Mm -hmm. So I say bravo. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm with you. I think that the, uh, the way that the mural expands over different planes looked really great. I think her use of pattern and repetition and color, there's some really nice passages mm -hmm. in that work. Do you want more political pop from your mur murals? Sometimes. Sometimes you just want something beautiful, and right. that's what that is. Mm -hmm. Jerry? I agree, and I love the fact that women graffitiists are moving into that space, mm -hmm. and it didn't look like the normal boy graffiti where they just write their names. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You heard it here, boys. Stop just writing your name. <laughs> Don't just write your name on the wall, okay? Draw flowers instead. Or leave the wall open so, you know, a female graffiti artist can use it. All right, our ninth uh, our, and penultimate installation finalist is another chosen by public vote. Ditch Lily Drawing by Nathan LaRoe, showing at Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park. The work is an arrangement of daylily stalks attached to the wall. And that's it. Simple. Kevin. Yeah, very simple. And I'm interested in the way that um, he's titled this a drawing, even though it's here in the installation category. Um, Chad, talk a, talk a little bit about that. What's, what's going on with the relationship between this uh, found object installation and the concept of drawing? Yeah, he's, he's very interested, I think, in, this, in the way that uh, shadow plays on the wall. So, you know, if the mark is his gesture of putting the stem into the wall, then you get all these uh, three-dimensional effects. Now, in this particular case, I think that could have been done a little more dynamically, but there is a kind of rhythm and a simple beauty to this piece that I can understand why the, uh, the popular vote got there. I'm not sure about the grid. Mm. You know, to me, I'm wondering why the grid? Why, you know, this lily that's this thing that moves, you know, in contrast to the piece that we just saw, right? Mm -hmm. Why a grid of dead stalks? I think that it's a, you know, this artist is trying, but I, I think that they could do better. I agree with that last part. They're trying, and I would then just tie one of their hands behind their back and say, go back into the forest and keep collecting mm -hmm. until you find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You're not looking yet. All right. All right. Um, what do you think it is they are looking for? <laughs> They won't let themselves know yet. This, that was a prisoner's art. When the prisoner makes the same mark every single day, every day, because that prisoner must be shut off from all feeling. And I feel that this was half shut off. Fascinating. Okay. Sorry, right. artist. Our last installation category finalist is a juried pick showing at the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts, titled Wars and Rumors of Wars by Eric Dixon. The work presents the history of American foreign and security policy over the last three decades in an interactive audio installation. As visitors move around the space, they trigger motion detectors, thereby unleashing historical audio samples drawn from addresses to the nation, congressional hearings, military and intelligence briefings, and other publicly available declassified sources. 
Kevin, tell us about this piece. Yeah, so politicians talking about war in the gift shop. Could you hear it? Was it working? Kristen, you're shaking your head. I mean, one, you couldn't hear it. Uh, so the location is problematic, but I also had a huge problem with the installation method. I mean, I couldn't help but be distracted by seeing the wires and, you know, I think that it was installed poorly. Another location installed differently, I might think differently. No, I think, it. yes, sure, there were problems with the installation, but the bigger problem here is that there's no risk. If you want to take on these big issues, you got to go big, mm -hmm. right? So art without risk is like trying to have a baby without sex. It's just not going to happen, yeah. right? So yeah. um, here we go. I mean, like, make it big, make it count. This is your moment. Mm -hmm. Agreed. It's a really important material and not really put to use, almost exploited in that sense. So we have a minute left. What, uh, what did you guys see today that we, that's not on this list that, that, that really caught your eye? This is a surprise question, surprise round. I see hundreds of artists breaking rules. I see hundreds of artists pursuing their vision. I see Grand Rapids and other places like this, like the two museums represented on my left and right, not leaving art history behind as so much as saying, we, there are many, ma many mansions mm -hmm. in this kingdom. Yeah. Totally agree, Jerry. I think there's, there's pure possibility here in, in Grand Rapids, and it's um, manifest in all the art. I think art at its best opens up a space for empathy for us to have this conversation, mm -hmm. to have this debate. Yeah. And I'm so proud of Grand Rapids and to be sitting here on this stage with all of you. It's Thanks. a big deal. Yeah, it is. I mean, echoing what they said, I'm blown away by this city and what's possible here. And I think it's an example to all of us that you can have uh, artists of all disciplines from all over the world, all skill levels, but also the institutional support, uh, the city support. I mean, it's phenomenal. I'm blown Let's hear away. it for our panelists. Yeah. Bravo. Those yeah. kind words. And our city. Well, that's it. We're out of time. Critical Discourse, Why These Finalists continues tomorrow night live on Wood TV 8 at 7 p.m. Join us as we discuss the finalists in the two-dimensional and, and time-based categories. It's going to be wild. And if you're curious who's going to win uh, the $500,000 in prizes at the end of this great event, turn into the Art Prize Awards where I will dance the tango. Seriously. Um, you can join the viewing party at 7.30 at Rosa Park Circle. Thanks for watching Critical, Critical Discourse. Good night.